Um, you guys can hear me okay? Okay, if you have your Bibles, let's open to 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, I am going to ask the guys up the back not to put it on the screen. Uh, if you have a Bible or if you have a phone, punch it in. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. If you have neither of those things, then just look at the person next to you or in front of you or whatever. Or you can just close your eyes and listen. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. <clears throat> now I will remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel which I proclaim to you, which you received and in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. For what I passed on to you as of utmost importance, I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is alive and it is sharp and that it can penetrate and pierce right to the very fabric of who we are. We thank you that it can challenge us and shape us and transform us to look more like Jesus. I pray this morning that as we open the scriptures, as we explore your word, that you'll pour out truth, you'll pour out revelation which resembles your character, uh, not us. And God, ultimately that we would be transformed. Father, we also just take time to think of people around the world that are in a completely different situation to us now. We think of Turkey and Syria and the tremendous death and devastation that's taken place. We think of the war in Russia and Ukraine. And we just think of places around the world where people don't have the freedom that we have to open the scriptures and talk and even have a Bible to read. Lord God, we just thank you for the amazing privilege that we have. We are truly blessed. And I pray that we wouldn't become complacent or too familiar with that. And so this morning as we unpack and as we explore, which is a great privilege, I pray you would show us Jesus and that we would look more like him. In Jesus' name, yeah. amen. Okay, you can take your seats. <clears throat> uh, before I start, just a small disclaimer. Uh, I have a very raspy throat. It's not COVID. I've taken a thousand COVID tests, so I can confidently say I don't have COVID, but I might uh, be coughing quite a bit, so please bear with me. But God is with us. We're going to get through it. Uh, I will start <clears throat> by, I, I want to just jump back to last week, Vision Sunday. Dad was up speaking and preaching and talking about what we're going to explore this year. What my, my aim this morning is to almost shine a magnifying glass on one thing that he said and just kind of expand on that and talk through that this morning. I'll quote him. He said this. He said, the gospel should be the starting point for our ministry. And I absolutely love that. And I 100% stand by that. I would go one step further and say the gospel should not only be the starting point of any ministry, but the gospel should be the foundation of our very lives. That everything we do, thank you so much, Pastor Dale. That everything we do, um, every action, our Monday to Saturday and our Sunday should be shaped and flowing out of the gospel message. This is of paramount, vital importance. The natural question to ask is, okay, so what is the gospel? What is the gospel? If we're going to live out of this thing, what is it? Uh, what are we living out of? The scriptures are clear that the gospel is the good news of what God has done in Jesus through his life, death and resurrection. I'm going to say that one more time because it's important that we get this. The scriptures are clear that the gospel is the good news of what God has done in Jesus through his life, death, and resurrection. My family, uh, my immediate family and my extended family, are right into gardening. They love it. My, my dad is a trained horticulturalist. I hope I said that right. My brother currently works in a nursery. 
My mum used to work in a nursery. My father-in-law loves gardening. My sister-in-law works in a nursery. My wife loves plants. I am surrounded by herbology. (laughs) The reality is, is that when it comes to gardening, I am terrible. When we first bought or we first got married and we moved into our apartment, I bought a bunch of plants because I was like, I can finally do this myself. In a matter of days, my plants died. And uh, I was so annoyed that I just left them there just to, and they just kind of stayed until we moved out, actually. It was pretty negligent on my end. However, despite my complete lack of understanding of how gardening works and my inability to keep a plant alive and grow it, I am smart enough to know that if you remove a plant from its soil, it's going to die. I'm smart enough to know that. I don't know too much more than that. But I'm smart enough to know is that if you take a plant or a tree, how big it is, how small it is, if you remove it from its soil, it is not going to last long. Our culture is taking the fruit of the gospel and removing it from its soil. That is, there are all these implications that flow out of the gospel, which we'll talk about. Our culture likes them is attracted to them because they're good things. However, it is not attracted to the gospel message. And so what is happening is our culture, our society, is removing the tree or the fruit or whatever flows out of the gospel from the soil of the gospel, and it's dying. I'm going to explain a little bit about that. Our world wants equality, justice, racial reconciliation, equal rights, peace, all these things flow out of the gospel. All these things are good. The gospel gave us these things. However, our culture wants them without the gospel and it is a chaotic mess. It does not work. It will not last long. Equality is a good biblical thing. But if we remove it from the context of the gospel, it will develop into chaos. And it doesn't take us too long to just look at our society, read the paper, to realize the state that we are in. The reality is that the dynamic and grand nature of the gospel impacts and affects all areas of life. There are entailments, implications, and required responses that flow out of the gospel. However, these things in and of themselves, are not the gospel. If we focus exclusively on the implications and not the gospel, there is a danger that will blur the two and the implication becomes the gospel. Do you hear what I'm saying? The things that flow out of the gospel, we will focus on those far too much that it almost becomes gospel to us. We focus on the wrong thing. Don Carson says this, Our response to the gospel is not the gospel. What God requires of us or whatever our responsibilities to God are, these things are not the gospel. The gospel is about what God has done. It is the good news about what God has done for us. If we read the entailments back into the gospel, then the gospel becomes less about what God has done in Christ Jesus on the cross and it becomes more about what we do. So before we talk about what the gospel is, let's just quickly look at or glance over some things that the gospel is not. That is anything that is not the death, resurrection of Christ is not the gospel. The gospel is not about becoming rich, famous, or in any way great, right? You might have heard of this as the prosperity gospel. That is not the gospel. The message of the gospel is not a message of gender, racial, or social equality. These are good things that as Christians we should desire and fight for, but they in and of themselves are not the gospel. The gospel is not about you choosing heaven or hell. Although that is a reality and that is true, that is not the gospel. The gospel is not repent and believe. 
We repent and believe the gospel, but repent and believe in and of itself is not the gospel. The gospel is not about anything that we have done or anything that we should do. The gospel is not about you and I doing anything. The gospel is about what God has done in and through the life, death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. There is a difference between living out the implications of the gospel and the gospel. The gospel comes first. So with your Bibles open, and we're going to just spend the next 10 minutes with our finger on the text, for lack of a better word, and we're going to just move through 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. Hear me, church. I am not saying that the implications of the gospel are wrong and that we shouldn't seek them. I am saying there is a higher priority that we have to understand. If we don't get that priority, if we don't understand what the gospel is, we're actually going to get the implications wrong. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying we shouldn't be striving and working for equality. Of course we should, but we need to do it in the context of the gospel. And we'll look at what that actually looks like towards the end. So with our finger on the text, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1, Paul says, Now, brothers and sisters, I remind you. If you're taking notes or if you're okay with scribbling in your Bible, just make a note of that word remind. I remind you. If you know Corinthians, if you've read it through, if you've done Reach Academy, you'd know this. First Corinthians is dealing with a series of issues within the church. And the way that Paul goes about it is he says there's this certain formula that he uses and it goes now concerning. So he'll go now concerning the divisions or now concerning the Lord's Supper or now concerning spiritual gifts. And it's this formula that he uses to introduce the new topic that he is going to spend some time Addressing, now concerning this, now concerning this, now concerning this, now concerning this. And if you track your Bible, that kind of will just introduce a new theme that he explores. Chapter 15, where Paul, where we got our verse from, Paul breaks this formula. Instead of saying now concerning, he says, now I remind you. He doesn't do this anywhere else in the letter. The change adds emphasis. What Paul is saying is that if you can get this right, if you can remind yourselves and understand and remember the gospel which we talked about, all these issues that we have been dealing with up until this point, if our foundation is the gospel, if we emphasize the gospel, all divisions, all issues will be solved. Not like one plus one equals two, but if we get this right, these things will kind of begin to take care of themselves if we understand and live out of the gospel. He says this, um, if I remind you of the gospel that I preached to you. The gospel I preached. The word for preach or proclaim, some versions might say, it isn't the normal word that the Bible normally uses for preach or proclaim. Okay, so when, the, when Mark says that Jesus went throughout the, the region preaching the good news, that's a different word to what Paul uses here. The the word that he uses is actually a repeat or it's the verb form of the word for gospel. Literally, you could read this or interpret that the gospel I gospeled to you, right? The gospel which I gospeled to you. It's almost like Paul is trying to stamp this word as clearly as he possibly can. Do you understand Corinthian church? Do you get it? The gospel, the gospel which I gospeled to you. Paul's repetition here shows his emphasis. We must get this right. Towards the end of verse 1 and going into verse 2, Paul says, in which you stand and by which you are being saved. Notice that the text doesn't say in which you stood and by which you were saved. There is a present tense, ongoing, up close and personal, in your face, reality about the gospel. In which you stand and by which you are being saved. It's present tense. 
The gospel is not about the singular moment that you became a Christian and that's it, all done and dusted. Let's move on to other things. The text makes it explicitly clear that this gospel involves the past, present and future. The verb stand implies a stationary existence. We don't walk, wander or run from the gospel. Standing implies stability, determination, conviction, and holding one's ground. It resists the temptation to wander and be distracted by other things. The gospel which we stand, on which we stand, not on which we stood. Standing is a decision that you and I make. We aren't forced to do this. Jesus isn't there with a gun to our head saying you have to sit. We make the decision. It is our decision whether or not we are going to stand on the gospel and continue to stand and not be distracted. Or if we do get distracted, to walk back and continue to stand on the gospel. On which you stand and by which you are being saved. The verb saved speaks of salvation. However, you would know salvation is not a one-time thing. We are saved, but we are also being saved, and one day we will be saved, right? Newsflash that I need to hear far more often than I'd like to admit. We are not a finished product. God is constantly and continually saving us and transforming us and sanctifying us and transforming us more and more into his image. Our turning to Christ is the beginning of our salvation, not the entirety of it. Let me say that again. Our turning to Christ is the beginning of our salvation journey, not the entirety of it. Jesus says at the end of Matthew's gospel, make disciples, not converts. Or decisions. Salvation is more about an ongoing work and journey rather than a one off moment. Now, notice the relationship between these two verbs of standing and saved, on which you stand and on which you and by which you are being saved. We stand on the gospel and we are being saved. Hear that difference? We are being saved, not we save ourselves. The action of saving is being done to us. All we have to do is stand on the gospel and not wander from it. God will do the rest. You don't need to add anything to the equation. You don't need to try and speed up the process. You don't need anything other than Jesus for that process of salvation to begin its work and continue its work. Not self-help books, not a whole bunch of sermons, not different uh, motivational seminars. All you need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus. And anyone that would try to tell you otherwise is lying. He is the one that does the work. And the end of verse 2, before Paul launches into what the gospel is, notice he's just gearing up to how we should approach it. The end of verse 2 says, If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. Paul concludes this introduction by reminding them of their faith. The biblical story constantly connects themes of gospel, salvation, and faith. And for Paul, it's no different. That word for believed is the same word that we get faith, right? Pistis. Our first response to the gospel message is to believe it, to put our faith in it, to throw your whole weight against it. That is the language of faith. To illustrate this, um, putting your faith in the chair only happens when you sit on the chair and trust it to carry your weight. I am not fully putting my faith in the chair if I stand over here and say, yeah, I believe or I know or I think or I'm sure, or the instruction manual says that this chair is going to carry my weight. I am putting my faith in the chair by sitting on the chair and trusting it to hold me. 
That is the language of faith. I am trusting the aeroplane and the pilot, not by sitting back and saying, oh, I know that the plane can get me from here to Hawaii. I put my faith in the plane by buying the ticket, checking in my luggage, sitting on the seat and saying, okay, let's go to Hawaii and trusting that I'm going to get there. That is the language of faith. It is to throw your whole weight against it. It is to believe in it or to trust in it, to depend on it to the point that if this fails, then I'm going to collapse. It is to put your whole life's weight against it. And again, we'll talk about that in just a few moments. To put your faith in the gospel is not simply to acknowledge it or even know the story. Satan and the demons know the story. Putting your faith in the gospel is to throw your entire weight behind it. Now we go to verse 3. This is the gospel. That Christ died for our sins. A lot can be said about Jesus' death that we don't have time for. There are important things that I don't want to ignore. Jesus' death deals with our sin problem. Jesus' death reconciles us back to God, deals with our guilt, redeems us from the power of sin, all good things that we should focus on. And as we come up to Easter, I'm sure we will. But I want to focus on two words. Christ died. Christ died. The death of Christ is not a tragic end to an otherwise beautiful story. Christ's crucifixion is the climactic, earth-shattering moment where Jesus defeats evil by letting it defeat him. The cross is not a moment where Jesus gets trapped or manipulated or things get out of hand. It's not even a moment where he had a chance to get out, but then the soldiers came at Gethsemane and took him and that's it. He's got no choice but to go along with it. Jesus orchestrates this event. John 10, 18 says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. How do you think Passion Week goes, by the way? Is it just a whole bunch of coincidences? Let's do this together if we know. How does it begin? Jesus enters Jerusalem doing what? What's he riding on? A donkey, brilliant. What's everybody shouting out? Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. If we know our Bibles, which you will if you do reach Academy, silent plug for Pastor Dale. (laughs) Zechariah 9 speaks about the king who enters Jerusalem on a donkey. Why do you think the Pharisees say to Jesus, tell everybody to be quiet? Because what Jesus is doing is putting himself on the same level of God, which is deeply offensive. And what's Jesus' response? Even the rocks understand what's going on. I.e., you Pharisees are as dumb as rocks. That's the proclamation. Then what does he do? What's his next big act? He clears out the temple, right? Enters into the very temple and totally disrupts the system. Pronouncing judgment once again on the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. And if you read the Bible, if you read especially Matthew's gospel, all these discussions begin to arise of wanting to kill him. Jesus knows this. So what does he do? He pronounces a whole bunch of woes on the Pharisees. Is he hiding away? No, he is provoking and orchestrating this event. I lay my life down. Nobody takes it from me. It's Passover week. This is not coincidence. Jesus isn't manipulated into the cross. He goes to the cross for you and I, for the joy set before him. He goes to the cross to deal once and for all with the sin problem. Not that he started, but we started. This is the gospel. I've gone off my notes. The climax of the life of Jesus is his death. The humble, self-giving, self-sacrificing ministry of Christ is emphasized to the highest degree when he lays his life down where he willingly lays his life down for the sin of the world, even those who are driving the nails into his hands. Christ died, not you and me. Christ died.
Verse 4, it says, and that he was raised to life on the third day. Paul spends the next four verses, which we won't explore, detailing the witnesses of the resurrected Christ. He doesn't spend this much time on Christ's death. It is vitally important that people get this. The resurrection happened. The resurrection is not simply the happy ending to the story. It is not they all lived happily ever after. The resurrection is so much more. Where Christ's death deals with the problem of sin, his resurrection deals with the problem of death. Death doesn't happen to Jesus. Jesus happens to death. Verse 20 to 22 says this, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. Christ has passed through death and come out the other side, thus defeating death. The resurrection of Christ transforms death. If you are in Christ, death is no longer an enemy. Death is the beginning of true living. This reality leads to Paul's conclusion at the end of the chapter where he says definitively, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The resurrection of Christ not only affirms that death is not the end, but it also shows us what the life to come will look like. The language of first fruits is language that anticipates a harvest of what is to come. If Christ is the first fruits of resurrection life, this means his example signals to us what is coming and what awaits. So my question to you is what do you think about when you think about eternal life? What do you think the life to come is going to look like? Is there fear there? The fear of the unknown. Or as like I've often thought and had discussions with people, the concept of eternity, that it never stops and goes on and 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 on, kind of like a groundhog day. Is something that that there's there's fear there or there's hesitation, you know, kind of thing. I get nervous sometimes in, that when we, when we speak about heaven, it's purely in the context of, well, hell is bad and you don't want to go there. And it's, we've got two options. And we spend more time speaking about how bad hell is rather than how good the resurrection life is. That... It just becomes about avoiding a place rather than going to a place. That's my concern. I remember as a young guy doing the street outreaches in Parramatta and there was a track or a pamphlet that had like this grotesque devil figure. And it was, you don't want to spend eternity with this guy, do you? And there's truth there, don't get me wrong. But if you go and listen to, if you read the, the, um, the New Testament where Paul speaks about the gospel, where Peter stands up in front of a whole bunch of people at Pentecost and preaches and 3,000 are saved. Hell is not mentioned once. It's that Christ was raised and thus he's defeated death. It's the goodness of the life to come. What do you think about when you think of eternal life? What do you think about? Are we just going to be ghosts on the cloud singing Kumbaya? Over and over and over again. Or just sitting on a cloud, just like ghosts floating around, not knowing what to do. I've heard heaven described as just an everlasting worship service. And while I understand that there's some truth to that, that's also just, I mean, if I'm being honest, it seems boring. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, just singing, singing, singing. Like, like let's think about this. I, I I don't think that's what heaven's going to be like. I don't think that's what the Bible tells us that resurrection life entails. And I know that I'm, I'm maybe dealing with some sacred cows here and it's hard to get our heads across this. I don't want to push anything. I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. I don't want to cause offense. 
It's hard to think like this, especially when we've heard a different narrative for so long. But I'd encourage you to read the resurrection stories in the Gospels and meditate on what they say. If Christ is the first fruits, if he is the example of what the life to come looks like, then we only have one place to look, and that's his resurrection life experiences. And what does it look like? The Gospel of John shows us that it looks like fish and chips on the beach. Right? I've heard people say that oh, like heaven is like a reset where we, we don't know anyone. But in the same breath, they say, I can't wait to ask Paul all these questions. And I think, well, <laughs> if you're not going to recognize a person you've just spent 50 years of life with, how on earth are you going to recognize the Apostle Paul? You understand what I'm, what I'm saying. I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but Jesus comes and he builds a fire and he has fish and chips with his disciples. He meets them in a room where there's full of fear. He drinks wine and it doesn't go all the way down to his sandals. He's not a ghost. He's a real embodied human, right? Jesus is still human right now, seated at the right hand of the Father. Our humanity and our relationship to one another deeply matters. Creation is not about to be destroyed, but restored and redeemed. You like cups of coffee? Who likes coffee? Wait till you have coffee where the beans have been roasted in the presence of God. I'm serious. I love Sri Lankan chicken curry. I can't wait for Jesus to cook me a Sri Lankan chicken curry. We're laughing and it's funny, but it's real. This is what resurrection life is going to look like. Deeply relational, deeply embodied, where we are engaging and living and relating to the one who created us, the one whose image we have been made in, the one who died to reconcile and redeem us to himself. This is what awaits us on the other side. Not kumbaya on a cloud or groundhog day. This is what waits us. What do you think about when you think of resurrection life? The resurrection is not about, and I'm being cheeky here, the resurrection is not about Pentecostal supernatural resurrection power to do miracles. The resurrection is about Jesus' defeat of death. And that is so much more important. So what does this all mean? We know what the gospel is, but how do I live out of the gospel? What does it mean to stand on the gospel? So in closing, We'll just look at um, his death and his resurrection. How do we live into Christ's death? The best example we have of that is Philippians 2, 5 to 8. In your relationships with one another, Paul says, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Our society wants the fruits of the gospel without the soil of the gospel. Fighting for justice, equality, racial reconciliation, peace, outside of the context of the humble, self-sacrificing Christ who lays his life down, will only end in mess. Our our culture's response is revenge, payback, and cancellation. But this is not the Jesus way. This approach rips the fruit of the gospel out of its soil. And as such, it is doomed to rot and fail. Our response, however, is to be like Christ. If we are misunderstood, then that is okay. If we are humiliated like Christ was on the cross, then that is okay. If standing up for what is right and true kills us, that is okay because we know that resurrection is waiting. They can do to us whatever they want. The reality of Christ's death and resurrection is that we win no matter what.
The resurrection of Christ is God's stamp of approval. It is an emphatic yes to the Jesus way. How do we live into Christ's resurrection? By knowing that no matter what happens, this is not the end. Let me explain how this has been real for my wife and I. (coughs) Pardon me. Uh, Two years ago, um, when we were figuring out how we, what we were going to kind of do with our lives, really. Uh, the big question of whether we go to Canada and, and start the Regent, um, so me starting studies at Regent, uh, starting that journey. We just thought we'd lodge the application and just see what doors open. At the same time that I lodged my application, my pop died. And around that same time, my application was accepted, which was incredibly exciting but we're also just dealing with the effects of death. <clears throat> we uh, moved over to Canada and we started that process. And that process was a season of incredible provision where we literally had, um, you know, people that we'd never met just depositing several thousand dollars in our account and saying, we believe in you and go for it, you know, out of nowhere. Just God just moving. A time where we, um, probably me, I, and I think I speak for Suze as well, that just feeling God's hand on our lives probably more than we have before. We land, get started, just this great community. I'm doing well in my study. Susanna's got a job. We fall pregnant, which is just so exciting. Six weeks later, we lose the baby. I can't look at you, honey. I'll start to cry. a.m. on a Friday morning, Susanna wakes up in the middle of the night with just sharp pain and in a matter of about 45 minutes, we we know what's happened. Going on a little bit further, I applied, pardon me, I applied for some scholarship and I get it, where the college has pretty much said, hey, we're going to cover 85% of your fees. At a moment where literally a week before we didn't have any money, and we said, how are we going to do this? And in my emotional um, security, I'm panicking. And, so, and Susanna says, let's pray. And so we pray. And then we get this letter saying, we're going to cover your fees. A week later, I get a call from dad saying that he's been diagnosed with terminal cancer. That death is lurking around the corner. We pack up everything, we come home. It's just a season of just feeling so out of place. We're still feeling God's hand. Then my uncle dies. And then um, December last year, we fall pregnant again. Sorry, November. Go to get a routine scan and the baby's heart has stopped beating. Just again, faced with the reality. This season, we have felt God's hand on our lives like we never have before. But we have also been surrounded by the reality of death. What's holding us together is not some kind of healing, although that's what we're believing for. And you understand right now we're in a season with my dad where the best language I can use is we're just every day staring death in the face. What's the future going to look like? Hey, Jesse, Susie, are you going back to Canada? We don't know. (laughs) You know, what's the future look like? Oh, everything's just dependent on that. Death is lurking. And I'm not naive enough to think that there are people here that have gone through worse. We are members of a community that in our own way have our own confrontation and reality with the problem of death. What's holding us together is not healing, although that's what I'm believing for. That's not what's holding me together. What holds me together is that Christ has defeated death. That I know that whatever happens, death is not the end. Right? Death is not the end. Romans 5 says this, And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, 
because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. This hope isn't some abstract hope, like I hope when I get home, there's gonna be ice cream. This hope in this context speaks of the hope of the life to come. And he says, Paul concluding, and hope does not put us to shame. That is, there's no just chance. There's no, oh, maybe it's going to work, some kind of probability. We know that this is a reality. This is the life that we live, knowing that Christ has defeated death, that no matter what comes, we have something greater waiting for us on the other side. C.S. Lewis writes this in the conclusion of his Narnia Um, series. Lucy has just said to Aslan, you keep sending us back home. We're coming in experiencing all this fun and joy and goodness with you, but you keep sending us home. But Aslan says this, the term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. Right, he's speaking of the resurrection. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. But we can truly say that they all lived happily ever after. For them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. This is the gospel. The gospel is the good news of what Christ has done through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If the Jesus way is the way, this means that we live this way, the Jesus way, as best as possible, laying our lives down for others. And we live knowing that this life is not the end. And the more you and I get this, it will radically change the way we live. I don't need to hold on to anything here. I don't need to hold on to my dad. I don't need to be fearful of a moment in the, in the speck of eternity that I might be away from him because I know that in the life to come, I'm going to be having coffee with him and surfing some great waves and having fish and chips, not just me and him, but my brothers and sisters, my wife, and most importantly, my God, Jesus. This is what Jesus has done for you and me. This is the gospel. It is not about avoiding hell. It is about embracing and looking towards the life to come. I can't wait for the life to come. I can't wait for the life to come. I can't wait for the life to come. This is where it's headed. (laughs) This is where it's headed. All right, I'll start ranting and rambling. Why don't we stand and let me pray for you? We're called to be gospel people, living out of this reality. So Father, I pray that we would daily hourly if necessary remind ourselves of what the gospel is that Jesus came died and was raised to life God I pray that this wouldn't be just a fairy tale to us but this would be the very fabric of how we live our lives I pray that we would live the Jesus way looking and expecting and hoping for the life to come I thank you for what you've done Jesus I thank you that you didn't need to do this, but you did. And I thank you that this is all headed towards eternity, where we can spend it with you as embodied, living, relational humans, enjoying your good creation, 
pray this would um, just ground who we are, that we'd live out of it, that this truth would transform us, not a bumper sticker or just some something that we say, but it would be who we are, gospel people. In Jesus' name, amen.